so we've discussed this broader principle of nations keeping promises, but what about making them in the first place? Was it wrong to encourage Ukraine to sign the Budapest Memorandum? No, I don't think at the time it was it was wrong. Uh, this was a time when the USSR uh, had, had just co uh, had collapsed a few years earlier, and it was quite important to prevent uh, the proliferation of nuclear states, uh, to uphold the NPT regime, uh, and to find new ways of enhancing security. And I think it's very important to understand the context uh, within which this agreement was taken. This was a time when Russia, Ukraine, and the West were all seen as sort of democratic partners. They all were led by democratic <laughs> systems. You know, they've been perfect, of course, uh, but uh, there was very much the perception that, um, you know, with the end of the Cold War, Russia would become uh, sort of a true member of the Western community of nations. That, and that was also what the Russian leadership was saying. We must remember very clearly how uh, President Yeltsin and Foreign Minister Kozirev, they very clearly talked about Russia becoming a member of the civilized club of nations in the West. Uh, and I think it would be very risky to think uh, that, uh, for example, uh, uh, Ukraine with nuclear weapons would have been more stable. Maybe it would have prevented an, uh, an operation by, um, by Russia in, in, in Ukraine. But, you know, what, what if we think that Russia would have operated uh, regardless? So, you know, uh, I think that it, it's very, very risky. I think the problem with a, uh, with a memorandum uh, was that, it, it, you know, as guarantors, it doesn't create the kind of commitment that we have, for example, within NATO with Article 5. So it gives them the right, gives guarantors the right to intervene, but not this sort of compelling necessity to intervene. Uh, and I think that's part of the problem. And as was mentioned by Professor Nye, I mean, the violator of the agreement was actually uh, Russia, not uh, the Western uh, European nations that were the guarantors. Yasmin, let me come to you. Um, Domitella just mentioned, um, in terms of the way that the memorandum was set up, um, it was always um, vague. Without any specific promises, this kind of agreement, was it always going to suffer this fate? If so, then was it wrong to encourage Ukraine to sign it? Well, I know that a lot of you Ukrainians think it is. I've been talking to some of the people I know, and they said, no, you know, we, a lot of us think it was a mistake. Um, and I think this mindset that Russia is the aggressor, and Russia is the aggressor. At the moment, Russia and China are the through, you know, are truly building up to, to a kind of power status that should worry us all. Uh, you know, across Africa, the Chinese presence is, is unavoidable from street to street. And it is a kind of silent colonialism based on economic power. So all of that is worrying. But at the same time, um, you know, I, for example, you know, there was always this assumption, wasn't there, that um, the U.S., for example, would always have a stable leader, a president, who, would, who knew what the dangers were of pressing the button. Then you get somebody like Donald Trump, and you begin to ask, was that wise to think that in these Western democracies, there are enough checks and balances so that it's okay for them to build up a nuclear arsenal, but not okay for um, the lesser nations. I mean, these are the big questions that are now being asked. And I think social media, for all its ills, has become a real platform for asking some of the questions that previous generations didn't ask. Who made the rules? Who kept the rules? Who broke the rules? Who broke the rules with punishment and who broke the rules without any consequences? And I think it is time to rethink all of these power relations and who holds the weaponry. Joseph, let me come to you on this. Um, same question, uh, was it wrong to encourage Ukraine to sign the Budapest Memorandum? And you heard what Yasmin um, had said there. And if I tag on, is part of the problem with the memorandum, the vagueness of its provisions, as Damatilla has highlighted? Well, <clears throat> from the point of view of the countries at the time, uh, you have to ask, what was the alternative? If you say, well, Ukraine could have kept it, these nuclear weapons, which were basically uh, the old Soviet nuclear weapons, there are many technologists who say they couldn't have maintained them a and B, uh, they were so dependent on 
uh, supply train chains and expertise from Moscow that the Russians might have taken them physically anyway. So was it a big mistake by the Ukrainians, as some Ukrainians are arguing today? Um, I don't think so. If we do this counterfactual and ask what might have happened if they refused to sign it, I'm not sure it's wrong. The, the more intriguing question to me in the counterfactual is if uh, Ukraine had not signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty and had developed its own smaller, more usable nuclear weapons, would it be capable of deterring uh, Russia? And uh, maybe, but maybe not. You have to ask, are there ever, ever cases you can think of where a, a non-nuclear power has attacked a nuclear power? And that happened when Argentina attacked Britain in the Falkland Islands. So I don't know. I think the maybe the problem was Ukraine believing too much in the uh, Budapest Agreement. Um, but uh, was the Budapest Agreement itself a bad idea, vague as it was? Uh, I think if you look at the counterfactual, I suppose I suggested, I don't think so. Tariq, let me come to you on exactly the same question. Was it a mistake? Was it was it wrong to encourage Ukraine to sign a uh, a vagueish um, Budapest memorandum? I agree uh, very strongly with Joseph Nye on this. Actually, no, I don't think it was wrong. I think the breakup of the Soviet Union uh, led to all sorts of things, but on the nuclear question, these were very dangerous things. I mean, there were some Soviet generals selling nuclear missiles uh, to third parties, uh, and the general view, I think, of any rational uh, state was to cut their numbers down. I mean, it, it happened in the Ukraine rightly. So, I mean, there's no way the uh, military of the former Soviet Union would have left nuclear weapons or stray nuclear missiles in Ukrainian hands or Kazakhstan hands. They did the same thing in Kazakhstan, which is not usually uh, discussed. The West flattered uh, Gaddafi in Libya to giving up his nuclear weapons. Of course, that example is not good because they then attacked him and totally wrecked and destroyed that country. But in any case, I'm not in favor of every single state getting nuclear weapons. The example, though, should come from some of the European powers. I mean, Britain is barely a nuclear power. It can't do anything militarily without the agreement of the United States. France is. Germany isn't. Japan isn't. There's a big queue of countries waiting to become a nuclear powers. And if small countries acquire these weapons through fair means or foul, then the argument for a massive increase in nuclear states becomes... Uh, becomes irresistible. But one more thing, if you, you permit me, uh, <clears throat> I know the current mode uh, or propaganda uh, uh, in the West is to blame the Russians for everything. I think a big mistake was made by the Russians, by uh, Gorbachev in not having a signed treaty prior to the unification of Germany, which settled some issues, including the neutrality of the Ukraine. I mean, the Ukraine said it would be neutral between the West and Russia. That was in its constitution till 2019. Uh, uh, why was this, uh, this clause then removed from the constitution? I think there was a big, big pressure on them. And the other thing about the Ukraine that you have to remember is it's not unified. Half the population till very recently was very pro-Russian. Odessa, uh, the big port town in the Ukraine, historic importance is predominantly a Russian town. So it's a mixed business in the Ukraine. It isn't just black and white. The population itself is divided. And thirdly, when uh, the Russians were meant to be our friends, before they argued for and got their own sovereignty and did as they please, basically mimicking the United States, uh, there was a huge crime committed by Putin and Yeltsin before him. And that was the assault on Chechnya. The Chechens asked if X... Y, Z, A, B, C, all these little parts of the former Soviet Union can be independence. Why not us? 
We're bigger than the Baltic states in some cases. What's the problem? And a huge war was unleashed, supported by Tony Blair and Bush. I mean, they actually praised uh, the Russians and Putin for doing it at a time when Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, was being raised to the ground. So please, let's not have this crap about international communities and morality and freedom and democracy. What is basically the West thought, their interests lay with Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and early Putin's Russia. And the crime, big crime of uh, Putin is not just the Crimea, it is asserting Russian sovereignty, to put it mildly. That is uh, what is going on. A final word to you on this one, uh, Domitilla. Would it have made any difference if the Budapest Memorandum was more formal and less vague and included the sort of Article 5 NATO um, assurances? I think that it would, I mean, the question of Ukraine's security orientation and protection is very, it's, it's really very complex and it's really lies at the crux of European security at the moment. So I think that even if at the time there would have been discussions of, of further security guarantees by the West, they would have raised similar questions. Because at the time when this was signed, the fate of Crimea was also sort of a bit discussed uh, and there were challenges there from Russia, which uh, at the time didn't materialize. Uh, but Russia was still negotiating with uh, Ukraine the fate of the Black Sea Fleet which is based on Sevastopol. So it would have been really not the right moment to move further uh, in terms of guarantees. But what is often forgotten is there is an additional treaty that was signed in 1998 between uh, the presidents of Russia and Ukraine, whereby they divided the Black Sea Fleet. Um, the, the lease of Sevastopol was granted to the Russian uh, Black Sea Fleet, the parts that ended up on, Russian, on Russia's hands and also whereby uh, Russia recognized the territorial integrity of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. So uh, there were many other instruments which allowed for Ukrainians to feel that their security <coughs> and their international borders were not uh, under threat. Uh, however, I would argue that today, you know, the West, uh, with the threat that is, seen, is being posed by Russia's mobilization around Ukraine's borders, is behaving uh, I think uh, quite effectively it is uh, providing, as I said, military and economic support. Uh, it is also reinforcing its commitment to uh, NATO's Eastern European uh, partners and allies. Uh, it is trying to see if it can uh, find a negotiated solution without necessarily uh, compromising on key principles uh, around NATO, around NATO security to its Eastern European allies, around um, the question of the open door policy, uh, which cannot be changed under the threat of Russian military invasion. And also there is a readiness to sort of negotiate on issues which are of concern to both sides around arms controls, transparency, confidence building measures. So I think that, uh, you know, at the moment, the position of the West, uh, I think I would argue, despite the difference of approaches and the perception that within Europe there are different uh, views about how to deal with Russia, especially around the energy question and the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. I think there is quite, quite strong cohesiveness. And I think that uh, uh, one cannot expect that, uh, you know, Western or sort of uh, American soldiers would be sent to Ukraine. Uh, and I think we're trading a very... I think, sorry, Damatella, you've uh, you've moved us into the third theme, which I probably should just introduce properly, and then um, and then and let's develop this. But just to wrap up where we were on the second theme, I think a lot of the um, the panel raised a range of issues around um, what the circumstances were at the time, and I think as um, as we've just heard from uh, Damatella, there were other subsequent agreements um, as well. So it is. Um, as always, uh, the counterfactual posed by Joseph Nye gives us the sense as well as to um, what uh, the context um, is. And I think Tariq and Yasmin raised very good points um, around um, all of these issues, which actually brings us to the current day. So we've looked at the past, the failings, the mistakes, the judgments, the counterfactual. So currently um, we find ourselves in the situation in the Ukraine and the question um, in this final theme, should the West stick to their word and seek to support Ukraine? If so, must this involve military and uh, the military 
or are there threats of economic sanctions enough? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.